Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. Welcome to this Sabbath morning study. As we continue looking at the book of Ezekiel in chapter 33, as we join together, as we consider carefully these final verses that Ezekiel presents, shall we praise our Heavenly Father not only for the rest of this Sabbath, but also for his loving kindness that he is willing to give us the time to understand that which he would have us to know. And that were these words that were presented so many years prior. Shall we now seek his guidance and praise him in a word of prayer? Gracious Father in heaven, we come before you and we thank you for all that you are doing in our lives. We ask now, Father, for your guidance. Direct us, please. Show us that which you would have us to do. We ask your forgiveness, Father, upon our sins. We ask that we may come into unity with our brothers and sisters, that we may be prepared for the message that you would have us to give. We thank you for all of the blessings that you've been providing in this last week. We thank you for this opportunity to read the words of your prophet so that your will may be done in our lives, in the lives of those with whom we come in contact. Show us now that which you would want us to understand. May your spirit direct us. May your angels protect us as we assemble here together. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Now, last week, we covered these verses. We're going to recap this, and then we're going to go on to the next portion of this book. Now, for I will lay the land most desolate, or as the 1769 Bible would show us, for I will lay the land desolation and desolation, and the pomp of her strength shall cease, and the mountains of Israel shall be desolate, that none shall pass through. So we have a repeat in this showing us that this is something we need to pay attention with. Then shall they that know that I am the Lord, when I have laid the land most desolate because of all their abominations which they have committed. We have quite a uh, quite a situation here. So in this, Ezekiel is being shown that the land is going to be desolate, that the land's strength is going to cease. And the mountains of Israel will be shall be desolate. Now, is Ezekiel talking about the literal mountains or is he speaking of the figurative mountains? How do we want to take this? How how have we applied this so far? Well, I mean, he would be talking about the literal mountains because he's talking about the literal destruction of Jerusalem, though Jerusalem has already been destroyed. Right. But you when when um they use this sort of, the, the tenses in Hebrew are really hard to distinguish because they don't have, they just have a complete and incomplete tense. So so this is is presented in an incomplete tense, but it doesn't mean that it's not, not complete. Because here he's talking in this context of about warning, right? So he's already warned Israel, right? Jerusalem's already been destroyed um, because the escapee has come from Jerusalem to tell him of this. Okay. So, um, so I mean, he's talking a bit to some degree that it's not complete, that the destruction isn't complete yet. So he's, he's basically saying it's going to continue. So what we're talking about here. This portion of Ezekiel would be occurring then in about 585 BC. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the escapee comes in January of 585. Okay. January 5th, I think it is on the Julian calendar. Right. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So, so when he's talking about this, this is still you know, six, six months after the city has been destroyed and and so he's telling them that this is going to continue. Okay, since this is presented in the incomplete text, does the comment from the chat apply here? Spiritual mountains, the churches, 
devoid of his presence because of their rebelliousness. In other words, if we consider the glorious holy mountain to be the Seventh day Adventist Church. Well, you can you can always apply it, you know, um, because all these histories are typical. So even though he's talking about literal, we can still apply it as a symbol. Okay. So this is occurring this this portion, since we're looking at this as the fifth of January five eighty five BC. This is occurring just before the prophecy of the Valley of the Dry Bones. Well, yeah, it's before the prophecy of the Valley of Dry Bones. That's in 37. Okay. So is Ezekiel 33, 29 saying, since it states, then they that know that I am the Lord, when I have laid the land most desolate because of all their abominations, which they have committed, that there will be a people that recognize what's going on and why it's going on? Yeah, it's actually January 8th, 585. Really? January 8th, okay. So we could look at this either as 1-8 or 8-1. That's very, that, that's intriguing to me because of the number pattern. Yeah, and it's January 5th is when the siege begins in 587. Okay. Because so, that's the 10th day of the 10th month. In 587, that the siege begins and the escapee comes on the fifth day of the 10th month in 585. So it's two years apart. Okay. Five days difference on the biblical, three days difference on the Julian. Okay. Now, we come to Ezekiel 3330. We come to a new thought, a new section. Ezekiel is instructed. Also, thou son of man, the children of thy people still are talking against thee by the walls and in the doors of the houses. And speak one to another, every one to his brother, saying, Come, I pray you, and hear what the word, what is the word that cometh forth from the Lord. So why are the children of thy people speaking against Ezekiel? I mean, let's let's remember, what is the purpose? What what is Sister White said specifically? about this chapter in Ezekiel because our ultimate our ultimate goal is to finish the minor prophets but what from the outset what had sister white said about the 33rd chapter of Ezekiel well we study it in connection with the book of Daniel <clears throat> when we went over Ezekiel 8 and 9 we went over two books two chapters mm -hmm that are showing what God is going to have to do with those whose work he does not accept. And Sister White is quite direct that Ezekiel 33 is the work that God approves. So here we have this verse, the children of thy people. So Ezekiel is being, would we say, set apart where the others, the others of the nation of Israel are talking against him. Yeah, it's, it's actually not talking against him. That okay. It doesn't say that in Hebrew. What does it say? Well, talking of him. So how are we to take it? It just means they're talking about him. Okay. It doesn't say against. It's nothing in the Hebrew that says against him. If we apply this to July 18th of 2020, were others in the church talking about the fact this prophecy went out? Mm -hmm. Were they talking about the fact that this didn't occur, but did they also recognize that it would occur? Did they choose to accept that? Well, it depends on the person. Right. But here... Um, so the idea of this is that they're not talking against him because they're speaking uh, close to him uh, by the walls and in the doors of the houses. And speak one to another, everyone to his brother and say, come, I pray you, hear what is the word that cometh forth from the Lord. So they're actually accepting the message. At least that's what it appears to be. But it, then it says, and they come unto thee as the people cometh and they sit before thee as my people. And they hear thy words, but they will not do them. 
for with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. So these are people that are willing to hear, but not to do. And and so I would think that that would refer to the people in the movement, not so much the people in the church. Does that make sense? Okay. Because the people came and they heard, right? They talked about it. They wanted to hear the message. But, and they came as a people that cometh, they sit before my, as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. And I think that would describe the history of this movement. Now, this there's a reference that's given within this verse, the reference about the speak one to another. And we would have to look at this reference from Isaiah 29, verse 13. Wherefore the Lord has said, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, and with their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me. And their fear toward me is taught by the precept of men. Are we worshiping God according to what other men tell us is important? Is this what what that's referring to? Um, well, to some degree. I mean, I I, th- I think it's just clearly that there's a people that, pretends to be interested in the truth, but aren't ultimately interested in it. All right. Yeah. So that was Isaiah 29, 13. So that's going to be uh, more not related to uh, speaking against the or anything. That's relating to come, I pray you and hear what is the word of the Lord that cometh from the word that cometh forth from the Lord. And they come unto thee as a people that cometh and sit before me. So it's referencing that. But yeah, so there's a group of people that professes to believe the truth and acts as if they do, they are interested in the truth, but they're not interested in doing it. Okay. So I I still think that that best describes this movement. Now, so one thing we have to remember with Ezekiel, right, because he represents uh, Samuel Snow, right, the midnight cry, because... Ezekiel's going to begin his prophesying on July 21st, on the fifth day of the fourth month, and his last vision is uh, the tenth day of the seventh month, October 22nd, last one in the book, not the last one he has. So, so this message, if we're going to apply it to now, we need to apply it in the con- in that context of that this movement is supposed to be Samuel Snow, or at least the message that we had of July 18th was the message of Samuel Snow. Okay. And then I'm just getting uh, back to that, um, the word there that's translated as against. All right. So that um, it's interesting that the number there is 681. So that could be an iteration of 168, the number of hours in a week, but also 186, the number of cardinal days from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month. <clears throat> and so the first time that shows up in the Bible is Leviticus uh, 1, verse 16. And um, that's going to be, and he shall pluck away his crop with his feathers and cast it beside the altar. So that word beside is the same as the word that's translated as against thee by. It's also near in Deuteronomy 16, 21, thou shalt not plant thee a grove of any trees near unto the altar of the Lord, right? So I think that's where they get the idea of against in the sense it's close to, but that just should be better translated as in in, in connection with or, or about. All right. Mm. Anyway, any other thoughts on this verse? So we will proceed. Ezekiel thirty three thirty one, And they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people. And here they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but with their heart they goeth after their covetousness. Now, here again. If we take the alternates, we would read this, and they come unto thee according to the coming of thy people. And my people sit before thee, and they hear thy words, 
but they will not do them. For with their mouth they make jests, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. Now, what else can we take from this verse, from 33 to 31? Okay, um, so that word, uh, I'm just looking at when the one they translated as jests. Okay. So how do they get jests out of that in that alternate translation? I'm just going according to what they printed in the Bible. Yeah, okay. Because the word itself, again, I'm gimel bet. I don't. I wouldn't take it as jests at all. I mean, it it refers to to love, you know, sort of sensual love. That means it, it means to breathe after. That is to love or to dote. So, <clears throat> so I'm not sure why they put jests there, but anyway. Okay, comment from the chat. Covetousness equals idolatry. That's a Bible verse, right? Isn't there a Bible verse that says that? Yes, Paul said that. I'm trying to look it up. Okay. Now, the word here, obviously, if that's the New Testament, it's a different word, but uh, here the word uh, betza means profit or unjust gain. Uh, sometimes acquired by violence. It also, it's also related to the word plunder, right? So so their mouth, with their mouth they show much love, but really they're just they're just seeking gain. And and again that could be applied to many people in the movement of what we saw happen. You know, people's personal ambition and so forth. Yeah, so Colossians three verse Colossians three five is the reference for that book. Okay. Thank you, Sister. So, Sister White states, Without the Spirit of God, a knowledge of his word is of no avail. The theory of truth, unaccompanied by the Holy Spirit, cannot quicken the soul or sanctify the heart. One may be familiar with the commands and promises of the Bible, but unless the Spirit of God sets the truth home, the character will not be transformed. Without the enlightenment of the Spirit, men will not be able to, to distinguish truth from error, and they will fall under the masterful deceptions of Satan. The class represented by the foolish virgins are not hypocrites. They have a regard for the truth. They have advocated the truth. They are attracted to those who believe the truth, but they will have not yielded themselves to the Holy Spirit's working. They have not fallen upon the rock, Christ Jesus, and permitted their old nature to be broken up. This class are represented also by the stony ground hearers. They receive the word with readiness, but they fail of assimilating its principles. Its influence is not abiding. The spirit works upon man's heart according to his desire and consent implanting in him a new nature. But the class represented by the foolish virgins have been content with a superficial work. They do not know God. They have not studied his character. They have not held communion with him. Therefore, they do not know how to trust, how to look and live. Their service to God denigrates into a form. They come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them, for with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. The Apostle Paul points out that this will be the special characteristic of those who live just before Christ's second coming. He says, in the last days, perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Second Timothy 3, 1 to 5. This is the class that in time of peril are found crying, peace and safety. They lull their hearts into security and dream not of danger. When startled from their lethargy, they discern their destitution and entreat others to supply their lack. But in spiritual things, no man can make up another's deficiency. 
the grace of God has been freely offered to every soul. The message of the gospel has been heralded. Let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take the water of life freely. Revelation 22, 17. But character is not transferable. No man can believe for another. No man can receive the spirit for another. No man can impart to another the character, which is the fruit of the spirit's working. Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, the land, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter. They shall but deliver their own souls by their righteousness. Ezekiel 14.20. What does this add to what our, our conversation has been about this verse, 33.31? Are the people that come before Ezekiel then represented as the foolish virgins? Yes, they are. It says that they hear the words of God, but do not perform them. So it's all a vain show. So here we are today. We have an instruction that we are to have the upper room experience. We are to come into unity with one another. Yet we have many that are saying, I don't agree with you. Therefore, I don't want to hear from you. Or that because we have a disagreement on this point, we need to either cast out or stop talking with others. Is this a true upper room experience? Far from it. In observing all that is here, we are responsible for our own salvation. But as we have covered this, especially earlier in this chapter, we have to realize that we do have a responsibility to others. And lo, thou art unto them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear thy words, but they do them not. What do we think of this? What is our consideration on this portion of the verse, this portion of the chapter? And it's just giving us a, a more visual description of what he's talking about. It's just an, a, an example or analogy. Right. So this is saying that because um, this is speaking of Ezekiel, that he's singing love songs to them. He has a pleasant voice. He can play the instrument well. And they hear his words, but they don't do them. So that, that they're attracted to it in some way but not enough to do it. Right. Not all who profess his name and wear his badge are Christ's. Many who have taught in my name, said Jesus, will be found wanting at last. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name have done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. There are persons who believe that they are right when they are wrong, while claiming Christ as their Lord and professedly doing great works in his name. They are workers of iniquity. With their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after the covetousness. He who declares God's word is to them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear thy words, but they do them not. A mere profession of discipleship is of no value. The faith in Christ which saves the soul is not what is represented to be by many. Believe, believe, they said, and you need not keep the law. But a belief that does not lead to obedience is presumption. The Apostle John said, He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. 1 John 2, 4. Let none cherish the idea that special providences or miraculous manifestations are to be the proof of the genuineness of their work, or of the ideas that they advocate. When persons will speak lightly of the word of God, 
and set their impressions, feelings, and exercises above the divine standard, we may know that they have no light in them. So the obvious ones. If we have someone that is preaching from the word of God, that is stating their belief in the law and the prophets, and yet they come out and state there is no Holy Spirit, should we follow one such as this? No. No. Okay. Well, this whole thing about, um, so when people speak lightly of the word of God, right? right, obviously somebody who's, you know, jokes and jests about God's word or doesn't or sort of contradicts God's word, you know, said, well, it says this here, but we really think this. I mean, those would be pretty obvious, I think, signs that that person doesn't take God's word seriously. But often people of that nature, the reason why they speak lightly of the word of God is they have some ideas, impressions, feelings, and, uh, that they think more important than God's word. And we see this with the spirit of prophecy as well. So it's, they're trying to lift their ideas above God's word. So I mean, are, it we, all are, kinds of things, are we ever to put our ideas above the Lord, the Lord's word? Well, definitely not. But we, we see this happening all the time. And, and, you know, because well, on Facebook, obviously, you see it a lot. But, um, you know, there's one brother who, you know, he, he accepts some of our stuff, but he has all these ideas that, you know, easily you can show that Ellen White doesn't support them. But, but they always have a twist on them. They're always, you know, he'll, he'll use some spirit of prophecy support, but taken out of its context. And, you know, and he doesn't, you know, I, I hope he doesn't realize what he's doing. But I, I try to point it out to him, you know, in, in a gentle way, because uh, because I do have a respect for him. He's written some pretty good books and stuff. But we have to submit to God, even if it goes against our feelings or you know, and it's hard to know, you know, what's going on in somebody else's heart. I guess we really need to focus up on ourselves here. But, you know, if we're going to be minimizing something in the Bible or spirit of prophecy because of our own personal feelings, we're, we're in great danger. We're in a huge danger. Now, this next document, this next manuscript, written on the 4th of July of 1897, which is also the 22nd of June. On the Julian calendar, many precious opportunities are lost by inattentive, careless hearers. Notwithstanding all the earnest labor put forth, no fruit is produced. The daily walk is no better, no higher than that of the worldly. There is no progressive development of Christian practice. Springing out of Christian principle, the result and evidence of spiritual life within the soul. All such are represented by that class of whom the Lord spoke to the prophet Ezekiel. So these verses being repeated by Mrs. White are represented of a single class. They come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people. And they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love. But their heart goeth after their covetousness. And lo, thou art unto them as a very lovely song, as one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear thy words, but they do them not. This class have no root in themselves. Their Christianity is superficial. It has not transformed their characters. They have a knowledge of the theory of the truth, but the heart is not melted, subdued, and converted. They believe for a time, but when tribulation arises and persecution comes for the truth's sake, they are offended and they fall away. Now, in this situation, as we're going through this document, here we have these two symbols. 
in America, what's the importance of July 4th? Well, it's Independence Day. Exactly. But then when we have been studying our other symbols, what was the importance of the 22nd of June? Well, that has to do with FFA. It's a symbol of FFA. Okay. A Herod, a Demos, an Alexander stand out in marked prominence on the pages of inspiration. Like these, their class do their work under the training of the enemy. As long as their path runs smoothly and in accordance with their own particular ideas, they are well satisfied to float along. But when obstacles or trials are met, when their personal habits or selfishness are rebuked, they turn away like the displeased disciples. Describing this class, <clears throat> the great apostle to the Gentiles says, Better had it been for them not to have known the way of righteousness than after they had known it, to turn from the holy commandment given them, Second Peter 2.21. Better, far better, had they never known the truth than to have had a knowledge of it and then turn traitor to its principles. So, Here's Peter being described as the great apostle to the Gentiles. Here we're being told that many of these of this class are doing their work under the training of the enemy. That is one of these difficult statements that she makes for us to have to accept. How often do we praise God when things are going smooth? But how often do we consider that we should be praising God even more when trials come upon us? I mean, nobody likes trials, but they are necessary. And the simple way to approach a trial is to realize that, that God has allowed it to occur for some reason. Right. So that that allows you to bear it. Well, how does the verse read that? God rebukes those that he loves. Chastens those that he loves. Right? Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, it's a sign that God loves us. I mean, this world is just temporary. So, you know, you just need to rise a little bit above your trials. It doesn't mean that it makes them easy. Trials are still trials. But if we understand the purposes of something, I mean, if you had a pain and you didn't know what caused it, it just seemed needless. That would be difficult. But if you had a pain and you knew the cause and you knew that that pain was something making you better or stronger, then then you could accept that pain much more readily. Right? That's okay. the way it is. So, like, if I'm backpacking and my legs hurt, uh, that's a different type of pain, even though it may even be worse than if I'm just sitting there and my leg hurts. And I don't know why, right? May not even hurt as hard, but it might bother me more just because I don't know the purpose of it. But if we can trust that God has a purpose, then we can endure great suffering because this only lasts for a moment. You know, the eternal weight of glory in the sufferings of this present world are not to be compared to the eternal weight of glory. Okay. Now another comment from the chat. Sister White said that such unruly Christians are assets to the enemy and injure his work greatly. Is this where we wish to be found? Is this the class that we wish to belong to? Now, as we go on, we're going to begin to cover letter 110 of 1897. You want to see these things in such a light that you would abhor yourself for your narrow selfishness. You are blind, and by precept and example, you have been communicating principles that will make others as blind as yourself. God looks at the motives which prompt to action. In his providence, he has allowed matters to come to light that will be reproved, and that, mo that most sharply. Wherein have you unselfishly benefited the school? You have withheld that which would have helped forward the work. You have looked on 
sitting on the devil's idle stool, seeing things which you thought you could improve, but you did not attempt to do this. In whose service were you? You might have helped in many ways if you had given heart, soul, strength, capabilities, all to God. When you do this, Christ will be yours, heaven will be yours, eternal life will be yours, all things through Christ will be yours. Do we agree with that statement? Yes. Okay. Did you come to this place to speculate with God, to see if you could not rob him here as you have done throughout all your life? You have placed yourself not as a true loyal brother, but as a fault finder, waiting an opportunity to take from God in jots and tittles and in larger things. Are we to be finding faults with other brothers and sisters? No. Okay. Because we're on the same, because we're on the same boat. Every time I point a finger at someone else, how many fingers do I have pointing back at me? You got four or three pointing right back at you. So does that not also say that I am three times more guilty than they? <clears throat> yeah. The children of thy people are still talking against thee by the walls and in the doors of the houses, and speak one to another, every one to his brother, saying, Come, I pray you, and hear what is the word that cometh from the Lord. And as they come unto thee, as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words. But they will not do them, for with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. And lo, thou art unto them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice, and can play well on an instrument, for they hear the words, but they do them not. From the book Education. These are lessons that only he who himself has learned can teach. Is this to be a corporate lesson or is this to be a very personal lesson? What is she saying here? It is because so many parents and teachers profess to believe the word of God while their lives deny its power that the teaching of scripture has no greater effect upon the youth. How many times have we heard it being bemoaned that children are leaving the church, yet where's the real problem? She's being blunt here. It's not in the kids. It's in the parents. It's in the teachers. Because they're not living to that which God would have them live. At times, the youth are brought to feel the power of the word. They see the preciousness of the love of Christ. They see the beauty of his character, the possibilities of a life given to his service. But in contrast, they see the life of those who profess to revere God's precepts. Of how many are the words true that were spoken to the prophet Ezekiel? Here again, she quotes Ezekiel 33, 30 to 32. Thy people speak one to another, every one to his brother, saying, Come, I pray you, and hear that, hear what is the word that cometh forth from the Lord. And they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. And lo, thou art unto them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear thy words, but they do them not. It is one thing to treat the Bible as a book of good moral instruction, to be heeded so far as it is consistent with the spirit of the times and our position in the world. It is another thing to regard it as it really is the word of the living God, the word that is our life, the word that is to mold our actions, our words, and our thoughts. To hold God's word as anything less than this is to reject it. And this rejection by those who profess to believe it is foremost 
among the causes of skepticism and infidelity in the youth. She's kind of blunt about this, isn't she? We need to study the word line upon line, precept upon precept. We need to take it as it reads to us, not as other men tell us it needs to be. Otherwise, we become in a situation where our representation to those around us leads them to become skeptics and infidels. It leads them to be cold, very cold, to anything that is taught in the word of God. Any other thoughts or comments <clears throat> on this particular passage? I think Sister White is clear on this, as, as, as she always is. <laughs> okay. What work is then before us? Are we to go on as we have, or are we to examine our position and examine our lives? Are we to have that Mara experience where we come before the looking glass? Mm -hmm. Examining daily and repenting daily. Right. Okay. We are coming close to the close of our time together today. Do we have any other thoughts, comments, or questions regarding that which we have covered? No. Okay. Yeah, and then in, in my study, we're we're gonna study some of the same things. <laughs> <laughs> A little bit, you know. Right. Um but of course that's kind of how it it always seems to be that way. We don't plan it that way. No, no, we don't. So, okay, shall we then close with a word of prayer? Mm -hmm. Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for showing us our great need of you. We ask, we ask, Father, for your blessing upon the study that is to follow. We ask for your guidance and your direction. Be with us now. Show us, Father, that which you would have us to do. Help us to consider carefully these words that we have addressed in this study so that we may more clearly do that work which you would have us to do. I pray for your blessing upon Theodore as he presents, upon those that will hear this message. Show us now, Father, how we may serve you better. For this we thank you. For this we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.